extreme health is, ooh, look at that. Hey guys, it's Carl with Columbia Water Gardens, and today I am in, right now we are in Oxford, Wisconsin. Oxford, Wisconsin. I've been traveling the country so far this year, um, helping other contractors put together some major, major projects. Um, and I think I counted so far this year, I've been in 12 states, and um, this week, uh, for the next three weeks, we're putting together a gigantic, um, what do you, how are you describing this pond, Damien? Um, it's, a, I'm going to consider it a permaculture farm pond. Okay. Uh, the homeowner's intent, he has 40 acres. It was previously all wooded with white pines, red pines, and, uh, black locusts. His goal is to turn it into an income producing farm. So he selectively logged swaths of trees out so that he can grow crops. And then the pond itself is going to be the headwaters to help feed the water to the property. It is majority sand. We are down eight feet so far of their excavation, and it is eight ready feet for liner. Sand. Yes, ready for liner to go under the liner. Um, and so we're going to capture all the water off the house, the garage, feed it into the pond. He's going to have fish in there. He's going to have two wetland filters, and the wetlands his intent is to grow wasabi, which is going to be an adventure. Um, and then any overflow from our system goes into the rest of the property to help feed all the crops and stuff. So it's a it's, it's a it's a great project. So yesterday you had. Myself, you had uh, Jeff Michaels from Pondering Waters, and you're out of Michigan, mm -hmm. just outside of Detroit. Correct. And Jeff and I, we worked together on several projects. Jeff, he came out and helped us with our Avenger Pond, uh, alongside with Christopher Yax of Aquascapes of Michiana. Mm -hmm. um, and both of these guys have really great YouTube channels. Uh, Chris, I've been following a lot lately. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to bounce over to you, Chris, because you've been highlighting the Avenger Project uh, on, your on your YouTube channel. Yes. Yes, we have. Um, I drop a new blog every Monday at uh, 10 a.m. So go ahead and check us out. Uh, go to YouTube and put just put in Aquascapes of Michiana. Uh, follow along. Great project that we did with uh, with Carl from Columbia Water Gardens uh, about a year and a half ago, wasn't it? Dude, you had to come out and finally see it all. I know. Again. I've actually got the final footage for it that we caught. I'll have to show you guys. I'll, I'll show you guys what I got. So. I had it all edited, ready to go, and then it, there was one piece that I needed to get off of another one of my um, external hard drives. Yeah. And I unplugged the hard drive that had all the source videos in my editor. And when I did that, it destroyed the it destroyed the video. Oh, and I and, and I, I just I took my laptop and I was like, <clears throat> I'm just gonna go ahead and walk away. I, I did. Right I, I was like, <laughs> somebody was holding my beer at that point, and yeah. I had to take it back. <laughs> um, and so the four of us are going to be joining together with your project next month. You've mm -hmm. got a project coming up. Is it safe to announce that? Uh. Oh, let's keep it we're going to keep it on the DL. Yeah. Okay. Friday. We're going to keep it on the DL the just a little bit. on Friday. So. so today it's pouring rain. Yes. How do you feel about that, Damien? It's working to our advantage. A uh, little bit of materials issue and it's working out. So we'll we'll make the best of the day. We're going to have this conversation, which I'm sure will be enlightening, not just for us, for everybody else watching. And we'll move forward and make up for it another day. So Cool. All right. Um... Jeff, you've been a master certified aquascape contractor for a very long time. Yep. And your work is outstanding. Appreciate that. Last week, Greg Woodstock, the owner, or two weeks ago, Greg Woodstock, the owner of Aquascapes, uh, came out and he finally got around <laughs> to shooting your vlog uh, of your, and I saw a lot of the pictures that were being captured for that vlog. Outstanding work. Thank you. It takes a lot of practice, you know. Yeah. You know, obviously. Have you gotten it right yet? I don't think I'll ever get it right, but you know. Well, you know, if you're, if you, you know, if you stop learning, you know, it's you stopped. I mean, it's that's why I come to all these events. That's why I work with other pond builders. That's why I watch other pond builders' videos. You gotta see what everybody else is doing. You gotta learn. And that's what makes you better. Yeah. You know, if you if you stop learning, you stop growing. Growing, you start growing yeah. yeah. There's a saying that I picked up on years ago um, that says, "When you green, you grow. When you're ripe, you rot." And I really right. believe in that. You know, <clears throat> and um, yeah, I've been doing this for 24 yeah, 24 years, and you're not I'm, even 24 years old. I, I know, but I <laughs> <laughs> 
Doesn't he look like? Doesn't he look look like Otter from Animal House? Oh, hundred percent. That's in my cell phone. I've got him stored as Otter. I like it. You know, um, I'll take it. So, so we were talking earlier. Um, we were talking earlier about uh, pond ecology because I don't know how the conversation turned. Chris, I think you kind of led into it a little bit. Actually, you did. You were you were on the phone with one of your clients from from Salt Lake City area. That's right. Yeah, that's and, right. So and you invited us in on the conversation to listen to what you were talking about, and it just kind of snowballed. John, from that's his yeah, name. John. Go, John. Mm -hmm. So we're, in, we're we're on the phone talking to John now. John has a really interesting sit setup, and I'll describe it to you guys. Um, rocks and liner, right? Mm -hmm. Typical ecosystem pond minus right. a skimmer, right? He's got a lot of external pumps and a lot of external filtration. So I think he has like some PondMax uh, biomechanical, you know, bio biomechanical filters, mm -hmm. um, either that or maybe there might be some Owasso with some UV lights built into him. Right. You know those biome biomechanical filters that have the sponges or the... I've seen them, I don't have a lot of experience with them. Yeah, so like Aquascape, they make one, you know, the Ultra Clear... The Ultra Clean, clean. Yep. Ultra Clean, right? Clean. So Aquascape makes them, but um, he also has a sieve um, on the side, and I believe he's got some UV lights and all this stuff. And um, through my website, he just purchased a uh, uh, a, big, a, a big bead filter. He hasn't gotten his wife's permission yet to build a wetland. Mm. Okay. Now, right, everyone nods because we know the benefit of wetland mm. filtration, yes. right? So, uh, Damien, um, your wetlands on your project. How big are they? I mean, how many aqua blocks did, <clears throat> did, did we assemble yesterday? Total aqua blocks assembled was 52, okay. um, but that also includes the intake bay and the wetland filters. I believe we're doing 10 per wetland filter. No, we're not. We're doing 23 per wetland filter. 23 per wetland, okay. Yeah, 10 per intake. Mixed up my numbers between the intakes. Yeah, so, I think it was like 70 something. <clears throat> 72, 72, 72 total. 72, 72 total. total. It was 50, yeah. 72 yeah. total assembled. We're, we may not yeah. use all of them. So. On a scale of one to 10, 10 being uh, ex, uh, you know, incredible results you guys have seen, my wetland filtration and the results that come off of my projects and everything, um, 20, something, 20 plus years of experience of pond building, wetland filter or biofilter, bead filter, what's your take, Jeff? Wetland, all, hands down, wetland. Okay. I mean, you, it just, it'll polish that water perfectly. Chris? Wetland, 100%. They're easier, they're, they're more natural. Um, they work better than mechanical and pressure filters and bead filters and all that kind of stuff, and they're easier to maintain. Damien? I'm the newest one here with only 10 years experience. The majority that I've installed have been biofalls, so the mechanical one, but I'm absolutely but I want to use the word as in theory, but I understand that the wetland is much better and introduce them every chance that I can. And that's why you brought the three of us out to help you with your project. Correct. So, um, but price, can, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, but if I can interject just a minute. We're not saying that biofalls don't work. No, I mean, no, 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 what, great what they have, yeah, no, what they, yes. yeah, wetlands are awesome, <coughs> but sometimes like in my area we don't have the room to put wet are, are you saying that so if greg's watching no 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 this is no, no, it's a yeah, good yeah, point yeah, no, it's yeah, a good yeah, point yeah well you, you know, don't want to discourage people from not using budget. right yes you know space and budget yeah, space, 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 and well, budget. space and budget but then you can create the space by adding additional biofalls and that's what a lot of people don't you know they, they don't think about they'll build their beginning pond and then they start to overstock their pond right. and they're overfeeding their fish and the pond biology goes haywire and we start throwing all sorts of chemicals, not biological treatments, but chemicals at it to try to solve the problem. Right. And when a really easy quick fix would be just upsell another biofalls and mm -hmm. you know put a little lap joint over the edge, move the rocks away, pop it in, set the secondary pump, maybe have one pump drawing from the bottom of the pond going up into the biofalls, you know? Um, what are your thoughts on the image from the coffee maker? Off? I'll be right back. Yeah. What are your thoughts? On adding the second biofall? Yeah. Perfect. <clears throat> I mean, especially, well, here's the thing with, especially new pond owners is, you know, they love their fish. Right. But then it's like an addi addiction. They want more and they want more and they want more, but that has a negative impact on the pond ecology itself because you're not balancing that out with filtration, getting rid of all that waste and ammonia that's building up inside the pond. Right. So that added, added beneficial uh, filtration is 
you know, going to be key. It's either that or you get rid of your fish. Or you start feeding them the right food. Like, um, all, ki all kidding aside and everything, um, I really believe that aquascapes, um, the uh, color enhancing fish food is some of the finest food that's out there on the market. It truly is. Uh, I'm not going to say it's the best because I don't want to insult other people that have put a lot of blood, sweat, and right. tears into their formulation. But their color change, their color enhancing. Gosh, that's another conversation. <laughs> well, maybe it is color changing. <laughs> it makes the reds redder, you know. Um, but uh, you know, their color enhancing food. One of the big uh, ingredients that we find at fault with a lot of our koi food is um, high phosphate levels, high phosphorus levels. Mm -hmm. And I've been telling customers for a long time, what you feed your fish, you feed your you feed your pond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you what do you think about that, Chris? It's definitely a balancing act. It's it's definitely something that you have to take in consideration on how much and how often that you're feeding your fish. Because yeah, once again, mm -hmm. if the fish if the fish aren't aren't eating it, I mean that's just direct nutrients that's going to the bottom of the pond. And you do that over time, I mean then you're going to start sparking a lot of issues with other things. I actually had a client that would not stop feeding her fish. Um, and she actually developed uh, deadly cyanobacterial that diatrophs. we were talking about earlier. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about. about so so I'm a proponent of of um, of diatoms, right? Because I know I'm like diatoms are the bottom of the food chain, right? You know, and but this cyanobacteria that you were talking about earlier, describe that for the viewers here. So cyanobacterial diatoms. Um, are actually poisonous. Uh, basically what it is, is, is in the pond industry, we all call it rock snot. Uh, but there's actually- It really is called rock snot. It is really called rock snot. It really is. But it, it looks like snot. It does. I mean, yeah. and so what it is, it's, a, it's an advanced algae that actually forms a rubber-like outer coating and it protects itself from copper-based uh, algicides and, and algistats. Um, so it, it's a very resistant and you actually have to use a peroxide based algicide in rather than a copper based. Uh, I learned all this from Tim Wood. So Tim, if you're, if you're watching or if you see this, thanks a lot for this information. I do appreciate it. Tim Wood, by the way, he's, he's awesome. He's one of the best builders in the industry yeah. and he's unrecognized. He's yes. under recognized. Yep. And he's also the president of the uh, Society of Lake Managers. I did not know so, that. Yes. So mm -hmm. like when it comes to lake management, which is something that my company also does as well, um, he is the guy that I go to. I ask all my questions and, and what do Side I Side note about Tim Witt, you guys may not know this, but at the last pandemonium that we had before the COVID breakout happened and all this stuff, we were, remember what we were, what we were building at Aqualand? The urns. The urns, right? The fountainscape. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And I had the privilege of being able to work alongside Tim Wood. And like you were saying earlier, you know, getting together and collaborating and bouncing ideas when you green, you grow, when you wrap your rod, we're, we're learning. Well, I got a chance to work out alongside Tim Wood as we're setting those, uh, those spillway stones mm -hmm. and building the edge stones around the waterfall that came down on the right hand side. Of that oh, yeah, display. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And I learned so much from Tim. You know, and if you know, Tim is a uh, Garden State Koi, right? No, 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 he's uh, no, 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 Tim Wood, excuse me, no, 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 no. Uh, Aquatic Edge, Aquatic Edge, Aquatic Edge, Aquatic Edge, yep. out of yeah. out of Pittsburgh, he's out of Pittsburgh. So, I was actually thinking about the other Tim from um, Garden State Koi, <laughs> 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 oh, who did thought, who did thought. So the yeah. other Tim. So based on <laughs> no Tim Wood, he's artist of the year. Yeah. Yes. yes. So Tim, he was artist of the year with Aquascape last year. Last year. Mm -hmm. So he's like the newest member, and he did a really great job in the sandbox this year. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. my bad. Who'd you vote for? <laughs> 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 I actually voted for Mark. Did you really? Yeah, I actually okay. voted for Mark. Um, Mark, I really believe that he nailed it, you know, with his uh, with his Northwest uh, Trout Trout Stream. And I think he did. I think he did a cool uh, job. I, I, you know, Tim, he did a great job because Tim, you know, he mimicked exactly what we would be right. installing the majority of the time. Right. But and so for Tim's purposes, he he did a fantastic job saying, okay, this is really what we install ninety five percent of the time. Right. You know. But in terms of overall wow factor and all that, I really really like Jack, but. 
you know, I'm not going to vote for Jack because he's got too many people voting, you know? <laughs> but but realistically, I mean, I actually really liked uh, what Mark did because it screamed so, 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 so since we're talking about that real quick, and I know the conversation is about pond biology, in Aquascape Sandbox, I was honest, who did you vote for? For Dan. Dan, who did you vote for? I voted for Mark. I really liked the trout. The yeah. trout was just, that was just the coolest freaking thing. The, the, the Getting the water temperature down for them to actually be able to, because that's the hardest thing. Oh yeah, thing they pour ice in there. Exactly. Or snow. Yeah. Snow, because we're yep. snowing outside, so they're exactly. like dumping snow. Because yes. that's the thing about trout is you have to have that lower temperature in order for them to survive. And right. I just thought like that just, that took it from, yeah, you know, that level to where everybody else was to... I'm going above. I'm going. I'm doing stuff that people aren't even thinking about. And now, like, yep. those videos you're going to find that on Team Aquascape on YouTube, right? Yep. So if you go into YouTube, go into Team Aquascape. What did, they just broke a hundred thousand subscribers on the so. channel, didn't they? Yeah, I think so. Now you said that you voted for who? That was a mistake. That was Mark. Oh, you voted. Yeah, so we got three Mark. Well, you were going Dan. We got Mark, Mark, yeah. Mark. Yeah, well, yeah. Same. Did you yeah. really? Same thing. Same thing. You're being truthful right now. Yeah. You voted for you voted for Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sorry, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not. No, he's not. No, we're not. He's still one. <laughs> he's still the. He's still, he's, he's, still better. he's still at the top of the food chain. Yeah. He's at the top of the pond pyramid. So he's like, whatever, guys. But going back to the cyanobacterial diatoms, you know that. The ones that were developing in my client's pond that, that we had the issue was it was actually the deadly algae, the, the blue, the blue algae that could actually kill kill animals and stuff like that. And her fish kept dying. And it was all because of the fish <coughs> the food that she was feeding, she was feeding them twice a day. Once before she went to work. What was she hold on, wait a minute. Um, because we don't want to bash a manufacturer. We don't want to do that. I don't remember what she was feeding them. Okay. So, because she wasn't ordering, she wasn't ordering from me. It was just I'm running. To the, I ran to the pet store, grab grab. Some so stuff. it was pet store food. Let, yeah, there you it go. It was pet store. Pet food. store food. Was it Walmart? Food? I have no idea. But it wasn't. But it wasn't anything that she was buying from you. No. It wasn't. It wasn't okay. anything that we carry or anything that we stock. You know, like Nichikawa or Aquascape and or anything like that. Okay. It, it was. It was the pet store. I'm just gonna run out and grab it because so. I I've, I've seen it with. Uh, and I'm not gonna mention the the manufacturer. Is it safe to say to describe what the food looks like sure. without mentioning a manufacturer? I think that'll work. Fish sticks. Yes, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fish sticks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So she actually developed a a, a very nasty cyanobacterial diatoms uh, in her pond. And how did she treat it? Uh, the I treated it with the peroxide based algicide. Okay, and now what percent? Twenty three point something something percent. Okay, hydrogen peroxide. So let's talk about let's talk about peroxide. And this is kind of where we started in with the conversation with John, with John, John from, from, from Salt Lake. Else, yeah. Okay, who needs what? Who needs what to be built for his pond? A wetland filter. Yeah. yeah, John, your wife needs a wetland filter, and you're not that far <laughs> a drive. So just show her the video. You know, just show her the show video. Her the video. <laughs> just show her the video. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about uh, let's talk about the conversation that led into the peroxide. Well, John's problem was that he has tannins in his water. His water mm -hmm. is brown, and he has all this great filtration. It's an ecosystem pond, but yet he was still having heavy organic matter dropping to the bottom, and it was decomposing over the time, over the time, producing tannins, producing tannins. So, uh, so, so for, for for the viewers that are watching this video right now. Um, tannin is basically, you know, tea water. tea water. So a couple of tea leaves will turn your pond into this. A couple of leaves, I don't want to say a couple, but an overabundance of leaves in your water will, you know, will, will produce this. Um, oak, oak trees, oak trees do, oak, oak trees do, yeah. do the, do we don't the, have a lot of oak where I live. They do the most. We don't have anything. Really. Yeah, no, it, it will turn your stuff. It will <laughs> turn your stuff exactly that color. You can still have clear water and see the bottom in some ponds and have tannins. And still have yeah, tannins. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's just like adding, it's like adding tea bags. If, if you right. add one tea bag, you get a certain, but you can still see through it. If you add mm -hmm. more tea bags, you're right. going to get a more oh, yeah. robust. 
color. So we were talking to Ed Ballou, the chief scientific officer, vice president of, uh, of the universe and king of all things ponds. <laughs> yes, a amazing man. Love you know, it. Um, when when yes. I go out on these builds, by the way, I, I I think to myself, just channel Ed. Channel Ed. Ed. Yeah, well, I'm, like, I'm like, Ed. <laughs> it's really hard, Ed, because I'm, yeah, I'm the extroverted, yeah. loud guy. We need those, we need those bracelets. <laughs> what would Ed do? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, what would Ed do? You know, what would just Ed like, do? You know, yeah, exactly. Ed, merch for your channel. Channel. You yep. need to get what the first one. What would Ed do? <laughs> we get the first one. Yes. So, yeah. I want the prototype. Can we just get yeah, can we just get one with a with a nice white shirt like you're wearing a you know priestly robe and it's WWED, you know? <laughs> you have to shave your head though too. I, uh, uh, no. I'm not, no, you know, I'll tell you what I would do is I'd put like one of those skull caps on, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, but you can check out Ed the Pond Professor on YouTube and um, we have a, a great Woodstock and I have a running bet right now with Ed that Ed's going to hit 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year. Okay. And that I'm going to hit 10,000 subscribers by the end of the year. And if that doesn't happen, then I have to go clean Greg's prompt pond this year. You know, I'm going to fly out to Chicago and clean his pond. Mm. If it does happen, then he's going to come out and vlog us a second time. Mm. Which would be torture for Greg. Well, at least it's a smaller pond this time, though. Yeah, at least it's a smaller <laughs> pond. <laughs> um, but going back to tannins, so I talked to Ed Ballou um, about tannins a while ago, and... And he said something very interesting. And again, when, when Ed talks, people listen. And he said, if you want to get rid of those tannins in the water, that we need to have an oxidizer. Now, an oxidizer, um, you know, the lightest oxidizer that we have is what we were talking about earlier, the peroxide, right? Mm -hmm. So hydrogen peroxide, Jeff, what strength is that off the shelf? 3%. 3%. Right? Yeah. Um, what's the dosage rate per thousand gallons? We talked about it earlier, do you remember? One quart. One quart per thousand gallons. Is it harmful for your bacteria colony to treat your pond at that level? No. Why? Because it's only 3%. It's not a real high dosage. You know, like if you're going to like 50%, something like that, then you'd be doing, you know, doing some harm. But I mean, you can probably do a little bit more on that as far as why it would harm the bacteria. Yeah. What's your take on that, Chris? Uh, my, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. Lot. I mean, it makes sense. Um, my thing is, is plant life. We okay. never, we, I wanted to ask, but we never got into the discussion. <clears throat> so at 3%, obviously if you're not harming uh, a bacteria colony, then you're obviously not harming your plant life. Correct. Now, once you get started, once you start getting into the higher concentrations, like what I'm using, which is 23%. Or 53%. Or 53%. Or 52? 52? Yeah, 52 point something something. Yeah. Or, uh, percentage. Uh, with eco blast. Yeah, with the bigger stuff. At what percentage do you actually start damaging plant life? That's that's a really that's good question. That's one thing that I'm actually trying to figure out right now. Well, so I, I really believe it's it, it's based on what your intentions are with um, with the outcome. Like if you want to just oxidize the water to clear up tannins, then start start at a low concentration, right? right? So um, how do we how how would how would we administer that? We talked about that earlier. How do we how do we how do we put that water treatment into the water? Oh, you mix it in a bucket with pond water, and then you said you, you guys just put it on the outside, you rinse out your bucket and throw it towards the center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why would we do that? Because your outside is gonna be it's gonna it's gonna be on the outside and it's gonna work its way work its way down. That's a logical. Well, That's a logical. You're actually diluting it a little bit more so it actually disperses evenly throughout the whole pond. Right. Well let's not forget about the fact that our ponds, when we build a pond, it's geothermal. Mm -hmm. Right? And so when you have these shelves, during the summer temperature, the water is cooler at the bottom and warmer at the top. Oh, yeah, sorry. Right? <laughs> and during the winter months, it's reverse. It flips. Yep. It yep. flips. And so when we're pouring our water in and around those shelves, we're taking advantage or we're using the geothermal characteristics of the pond right. to our advantage to help us increase the, the efficacy, the effectiveness of the water treatment that we're putting into the pond. Right. So um, then our conversation turned to new pun syndrome. Yes. Do you, do you feel comfortable showing pictures without mentioning names or anything of that consult? That we had, that I had on Friday? Yeah. Uh, yes, can I, I can. I, I had a prime example of this. 
Uh, in, in my area, I'm starting to run into a lot more of, not necessarily clients, but also builds that I have where the pond is in full, full sun all day long. And uh, being from a constructional background, not necessarily, you know, an Ed Ballou where I'm from. Uh, Give your chair a little oh, bit, dude. Where I'm uh, uh, <laughs> a science background and more of a constructional background, these types of things are new to me. And that's where I'm learning and I'm growing as a contractor. But I had a client uh, the other last, actually last week, and um, I, had a, I had a consultation with her. And I'm trying to find. I don't think I can unsee that picture that I just saw. <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys can see this, hold that up a little closer because you got that. That is actually their pond. Now that is an 8,000 gallon pond and they have roughly 150 koi. And if you guys can see the koi that are coming up from the pond, at least 75 of them are a good two feet, 24 inches. So that is, and that's the color. They're in full sun all day. I did not build this. This was built by another contractor, um, but this is what they're dealing with five years later. So we kind of got into talking about that and we were talking about, um, <clears throat> let's see, I'm gonna just pause that real quick. This video that I put out, so this customer, this is Lola's pond and I love Lola. Her husband um, passed away uh, shortly after we built this pond and she's just a very, very dear lady and I love her to pieces. But we, we rebuilt this pond just like your situation with mm -hmm. yours. The pond was built wrong. Um, there were holes all through the liner, so I had to completely do a complete tear apart and rebuild. But the interesting thing about this rebuild was is that the customer wanted it rebuilt the way that it was. Mm -hmm. And so I like literally had to take it apart and put it back together again, yeah. put a few of my little artistic tweaks in it or whatever right. and put it back together. And shortly after we built that pond, it went green. And this video is on my YouTube channel. It was published um, May of 2019. It's got 132,000 views. And it has had many, many people across the country calling me and asking me, okay, what it is that we did to clear it up because this pond is just as green as yours. Right. And in Southern California, it's so full sun. You get more, yeah, you guys have more sun and more heat than we do. So we got hammered. Yeah. Right. And so the conversation turned to, well, how do we clear it up? And so do you remember, do you remember what kind of bacteria it was that we were talking about? Um, in that oh, conversation. No, photosynthetic. photosynthetic. Yeah, photosynthetic. So photosynthetic bacteria, um, for those of you that are watching this video, a photosynthetic bacteria is, um, is going to work in those full sun situations and it's gonna to work to your advantage. Right. So Aquascape makes a photosynthetic bacteria. It's their professional blend. Yep. Uh, professional blend, lake, Management, management yep. treatment, which is actually a different approach to lake management, all in its all, all in its own, because a lot of lake management is more of big stuff, lots of organic matter, stratification, turnover, those kinds of things. So we're more focused on enzymes right. and breaking things down and stuff like that, you know, and using phosphate binders and enzymes to do all of those kinds of things. Whereas Aquascape's approach is going to be more of the photosynthetic, which I never thought about, you know. I, well, they really don't it. talk that much about it because, uh, you know, as much as, as much as they want us to, to know the pond biology of it, right. unfortunately, there's a lot of contractors that just, they just, we just want to build ponds. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of us on the higher level of things that are, that, that are really like looking into how does, how does all this stuff work, right. you know. Um, so, you know, let, Jeff, I'd like you to talk about competitive exclusion because again, you've been doing this for a long time, um, and how competitive exclusion works, uh, against this and for us. Do you want to feel that? Well, putting you on the spot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this was not part of our discussion yeah, no, no, originally. Really was it? <laughs> competitive exclusion, well, what do you want me to talk Well, competitive exclusion as far as what? As far as how do we control algae by outcompeting its food source? Not you against other contractors. Oh yeah. no, I mean, <laughs> I'm not worried about that. Yeah, uh, trust me, I'm getting competitive experience. That was the first thing. Woo, <laughs> <laughs> woo, we're getting deep. No, let's not do that. Stop. Yeah. No. Stop. I 
told you, family e channel ecology. friendly. Ecology. 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 Do you want to play or pass? Pass. Pass. I think. Okay, do you want to play or pass? I'll play. You want to play? I'll play. All right, so then you and I, we're going to, what, 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 how about we give a really good example of competitive exclusion? Okay. All right? Hold on just a second. All right. Be right back. Can Thank I go way back and ask a quick question? Yeah. yeah. I apologize for the walkout. But anyways, um, you were talking about your client feeding fish twice a day. Yeah. How many times should you feed your fish? How often? Once, Once a month. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 don't listen to me. <laughs> I, 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 I just placed an order with Nish. They're just kidding. <laughs> well, well, that's a lot. Before we go on to that, you can actually clear up a pond too. Well, for one fish load, but it's how many times those customers are actually feeding their fish. Like I've had Gosh. several customers that I've solved their pond clarity issues with just having them stop feeding their fish once or twice a day. Right. So what is it? What what is? Are, are, are we going based off it? You know, because uh, from okay, that from right, that specific that from that specific now. client Sorry. that we were talking about with the cyanobacterial <laughs> diatoms, I I told her once a month. Can I tell you what's really going on? Sure. All right. By let's be honest, guys. We're all professionals in the room, okay? And we've been doing this for a long time. All right. of us have, mm -hmm. okay? Including you too, Damien. You said ten years. That's yes, a long yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't um, throw that now. Still learning. Yeah, well, I just said I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Yeah. at the table. That was all Look, I was saying. Is any one of us at the pond professor? No, no. And he's still learning. Yeah. <clears throat> you know. So okay. So let's go. So let's talk about this for a second. Have you ever? Now we're going to be real honest here for a second. We got two other guys in the room, um, that work for Damien. Did you guys know that koi fish have molars? True or false? You're nodding yes. I had no idea. You had no idea? I had no idea. Yeah. Yes. Did you? No. 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 <laughs> Guys, I'm not kidding you. I was over at, um, at a major pet food supplier picking up dog food because I like to feed my dog really good quality grain food, right? Mm -hmm. I got a Labrador. And so, and, and, and I like supporting pet stores. It's just my thing, you know? And I have to wander through the fish area on my way through. And there's a bag of fish sticks by, by an unnamed manufacturer. We're not going to talk about who the gotcha. manufacturer is. And on the bag, my wife, and on the bag, it says that, um, that uh, uh, fish don't have teeth. Pond fish because pond fish don't have teeth. And I was thinking, this is really, this is a misnomer, right? Mm -hmm. And so remember earlier we were saying, what you feed your fish, you feed it's your pond, pond. Yep. okay? So watch this for a second. Fish sticks, which I believe cause a major, they're major contributors to your customer's problem, okay? And you'll never see me selling them. I refuse to sell them because mm -hmm. I hate them that much. Because here's what happens. They're very, very dry, okay? Their, their moisture content is exceptionally low. So when you have a dry food, what happens is, is that that dry food has it, it, it to make it float, to make it puffy, it, it, the majority of your vitamins have been baked out of it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. In the extrusion process, your vitamins are baked out of it. So your vitamin A content, your vitamin C content, your B12 content, your, your B12, those aren't in there. Okay. Well, they're in there, but not in the concentrated levels. Like for example, in a sinking food would be right. But watch what happens. You take a fish stick and the fish eat it and they're drawn to it because they got garlic and stuff like that in it. So they're programmed biologically to strike at it. And you're, and you're thinking, oh my God, my fish, they love it so much. And then you're like, dude, you sprinkle some garlic powder on your other fish food and they'll strike on that too. Right. You know, but what's happening is, is that your fish, when they, when they put it into their mouth, they're, um, you know, they're chewing it with their molars that are backed by their gill plates. And as they chew it with their molars, and you'll see this in an aquarium. If you have fish inside of an oh, aquarium, it, it comes out. out. Mm. So it's not going into their digestive system, which is very simplistic. Coming out their gills. It's coming out their gills. And so as it comes out their gills, where is it going? It's oh, going into the pond. pond. And it's messing things up. And so that's why I, I just, I'm, I'm dead set against that stuff. 
I like mm. I, I like giving your fish treats like koi crunchies and stuff like that, right. you know, but those aren't that's not the primary food. Those are right. like treats. Yes. And people people mis mistreat substituting treats for food, right. you know, and then they end up making messes out of them. Yep. So understanding the biology of that. So we were talking about fish health, fish food. Why did we go down that rabbit hole? Because he asked the question, how many times well, how many times do they feed them a day? Yes. yes. Yeah, so no, you no, want how many to... times should they feed them? Not per day. Because in some feed cases, them. I know it may be yeah. once or twice okay. a week. So, so if you have a string algae, if, if, your, if your pond is loaded with string algae, how often would you feed your fish? Yeah. Once a month. String algae? Almost never. String algae? Probably twice a month. Yeah. So we're all in agreement right now. Just stop feeding. Yeah. Let, mm -hmm. them, let them mow the grass. Yep. You know? Just mow the lawn. Um, and so, and so I, I'm going to come back and I'm going to answer that question by... How often should you feed them? I'm, I'm going to say, well, what's what's the, what does your pond look like? Right. Do the fish need supplement? Right. Because that's really what you're doing is the koi fish are going to take care of the ecosystem that they're in, and right. you are supplementing, you know, kind of like grass carp. Yeah. You, you know, uh, grass carp uh, uh, in in a lake. You know, you have high, you know, submerged vegetation and stuff like that. We introduce grass carp because grass carp are vegetarians, and they're like right. hungry teenagers when we introduce them. Right. And they're just gonna just I mean mound down, but it gets to the point to where they've eaten everything in the pond and things need to be supplemented. That's right. And like for example, I shot a video for at a customer of mine's pond that I built out in Highland. Um, I haven't put it up on my YouTube channel. Highland is a suburb of San Bernardino in Southern California, and there, we're we're looking down in four foot deep water, and and he's got these beautiful fish that he bought from Barstow Koi Farm. Ken Liu, one of my he's my koi teacher. He's he's the guy that's taught me so much about fish health and everything he's my he's my teacher um on that side of things and the fish are in there they're sucking in the ro these 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 rocks on the bottom of the pond chewing them up and spinning them back out the gills yeah and oh, okay. so, not out the gills out their mouth they're oh, just sucking mouth. them up oh, okay, okay. chewing them up sucking mm -hmm. the sucking the algae off and they're literally cleaning the pond they're literally cleaning the pond and and let me tell you something about um bob's pond it's gorgeous it's crystal clear it's well managed He's been a pond keeper for a very long time, and he knows what he's doing, you know. Um, so to answer your question, Damien, uh, I would I would look at the pond first, and 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 approach it with what you feed your fish. You're feeding your pond, okay. and say, does the pond need to be fed? It's really not about do the fish need to be fed. Does the pond need to be fed? Right. Because. If you whatever fish food that, that's not being digested is going to end up into the ecosystem of the pond, right. and that it's that ecosystem within the pond that's supposed to be feeding the fish, not you. So, I, I guess it's just about a mindset. Now I know that there's going to be be people watching this video. They're going to be like completely in complete disagreement, you know, or their mind's going to be blown. But again, we're talking about ecosystem pond management. We're not talking about outdoor aquariums. Right. Right. Now. An outdoor aquarium, and I don't, I don't mean to be rude, right? But an outdoor aquarium is like calling this, calling this um, coffee cup a pond. Yeah. You know where they, where people will take like a plastic tub and and say, look at my pond, yeah. and it's a hundred gallons, and then they're like a week later, I don't understand why it's turning green. I I, I drained it all out. I scrubbed all the walls down. I got it all good and clean, and it's green all over. You're laughing. Why is that funny? Because they basically destroyed everything that was good in there that could potentially actually keep it clean on its own. Yeah. Especially if they don't have any real filtration. Right. Right. It's so, true. And how frustrating is... We were talking about this on the way out to the job site about these these Facebook groups and how frustrating some of them mm -hmm. are. Um, and we just... we As professionals, we try to, you know... Try, just, to, try to advise. We try to gentle. advise, but, in, you know, and be, and be polite, yeah. but... How often is it that we see in these Facebook groups just absolute disasters that are caused by, by the the what 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 do you think the number one cause of disaster in a, in, in a DIY pond is? Not doing the research on the upfront. You know they set it up like you said with the Rubbermaid tub, which is fine for temporary housing, but if you're setting it up as a pond, you still need that filtration. You need the water movement. You need all that biological stuff going on, and you don't need you shouldn't be putting thirty fish in a hundred gallon pond. And yeah. say, oh, there's my or tub, and say, there's my pond. I mean, it's a good start. You know, we, I've always learned that there's right. people do Dip three, your toes in first. Yeah. People, people, what I've been taught is people do three ponds. They do something like that. They yep. say, hey, this is really cool. I love my fish. 
they move on to a bigger, maybe it's the bigger drop-in kind of preform pond that way, or they do a lighter pond themselves. Like a little eight by 11 or right, something. Yeah, right, you know? and then they call in somebody else to build it. And, and now they've got their 15 by 20s. Right. right, and everything is built with the proper filtration and water movement. and Because you know, they understand it now. Size. Right, yeah. Right. So. Um, Jeff, what's your take on that? And I know that you're in a lot of those groups too. And you're very quiet. You're yeah. Jeff's the most PC guy in the world. <laughs> he really is. Life. He really is. He's I'm afraid to talk. I'm <laughs> the biggest thing is it's filtration. Especially new pond owners, that they, I think they miss the filtration part of it, which is actually key. Well, I think what they do is, is they read what's on the box and they take that as as yeah. uh, as gospel. gospel. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So gospel. My biggest thing is okay. You get this filter off the shelf and it says it it'll filter thirty thousand gallons. You know, it'll filter a hundred gallons of water. Yeah. Well your filter pad is literally this big. Like, yeah, yeah. How can a filter pad this big right. filter a hundred gallons of water? Yeah. Right? And it's mechanical. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> Look, I'm okay with those little the, with those little like um mechanical drop in filters in quarantine tanks when right. you know when we're doing a clean out or yeah. whatever, because the five hundred gallon quarantine tank our fish are in a stressful situation because we moved them out of their pond and we need to be able to provide it as clean, you know, or let's say that we have quarantine tanks set up because we're introducing new fish, right? you know? Um, so yeah, it, it's, it, it, you've got to be, you, you've, you've got to be, so that brings in the other major part of the discussion. Everybody talks about the, how many fish per gallon, you know? Yeah. And that's that's just, yeah, yeah, we had this discussion had about yeah. about that pond, and and I was trying to figure out how many fish they are reasonably able to keep in that, and we I think we figured out it was supposed to be forty two fish, and they had a hundred and forty two. It is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, the best hamburger up in um, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, there's a re there's a restaurant that's up there that has like. Um, red eared slider races in their aquarium right oh, when you cool. walk in yeah. and it's uh and it's like a beer house you know restaurant bar and all this stuff and you'll know it because it's got the red eared sliders if you ever go to that and i don't know what the name of the place is but if you ever go there order the 42. it's the best damn hamburger you'll ever eat okay you know no offense to that place you took me to cops cops that's pretty Tom's good custard that's good <laughs> milwaukee it's, wisconsin yeah but you know the 42. Yeah, plug it, so yeah um, so we've talked about, so let's go back to competitive exclusion. <laughs> hey, what, Chris. What are we talking fish per gallon? Oh, fish per gallon. Yeah. 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 Let's finish that. Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> All right. So what's, so what's your number? The number that I've been using yeah. is one inch per t one, 10 gallons per one inch of fish. Okay. How about you? Pass. You do the same yeah. thing. I was trying to figure. I was, it's just converted. It, it's yeah. hundred gallons, gallons to ten, 10 inches of fish. Yeah, that's exactly that's, that's, what, you told, yeah, that's what he told. That's what he told me. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's the exact same thing. Yeah, one inch to ten gallons. Yeah. So one to ten ratio. One to ten. Yep. I do. Um, I do a one to two ratio. One to two. Yeah, I do one to two. Um, so, and I base that based on, um, based on the filtration capabilities of the pond, not based on the actual size of the pond. Right. So you're saying one inch of fish per two gallons of water? No. Uh, that's two to ten. A two to ten. Okay, well that's, that's why yeah. when you said one so to one two, to I just wanted to make so sure. So he does one to five. No, 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 no. Excuse me, no, no, no. One to, it would be one to twenty. Oh, okay. It would so be one to twenty. 20. So I'm actually okay. double what you guys are at. Gotcha. Yeah. But again, I'm in a little bit more of a harsher environment in California. Yeah. And so uh, out here, you know, our, we have a lot more direct sun. We don't have all the, you know, but you guys have actually something that's really interesting that we don't really get that much out in California. You want water. Winter. Winter. <laughs> no, water. water. <laughs> it's water. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Haven't you heard the water wars in California just yeah. started? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's on again. We're right. not full-scale drought. You know, we're not allowed to drink water anymore. We have to drink a lot. Uh, what is that stuff from, um, we have to drink the electrolytes, you know, from, uh, idiocracy. Oh, that's right. Yeah. We water our crops with electrolytes, like you know, Mead that's buying Hoover Dam. yeah, maybe Hoover Dam. Lake, that's who, Lake Mead's buying there. Cause so Lake Mead's by Hoover Dam. It's bought down 140 feet. Lake Mead, uh, Lake Powell is a really bad one. Okay. Lake Powell is above Lake Mead. Right. So Lake Powell is down like, uh, is, is they're, they're finding, you know, Ancient civilizations or something. I mean, they're, they're right, like, right. <laughs> they found an alien, a crashed alien spaceship from 1940. No, I mean, it's like really bad over there. Right. Lake Mead is down really, really bad. 
Um, so Lake Powell, Lake Mead, but it's interesting, Lake Havasu is full, and I, I go to Lake Havasu a lot, and then um, the Parker Strip, which is below the Parker Dam, which is what holds back Lake Havasu. And what's very interesting is, is that when you get down to Lake Havasu and then the Parker Strip, you have an abundance of water. I mean, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. And that feeds the Imperial Valley and goes down towards the, uh, the, the largest ecological disaster known to, um, known to California at least, and that's the Salton Sea, you know. Uh, but anyways, um, competitive. Before we go there, oh. it's been pouring down rain outside. And um, let me ask this question going around the room. Rainfall, good or bad for puns? Bad. Okay, good or bad for puns? I want to say good because it keeps it full. But. Okay, that's good. I, I like that. I, like I, will, that I, will, I, will, I will explain further. I understand. Once we go around the I, table. Okay, I think, I think you and I are on the same I page. Think I might. think we are. Yeah. I think we are. How about you, Jeff? Good bad. or bad? bad? Bad. Okay. And I'm going to say rainfall is bad for puns. Yep. Um, and not to put you on the spot, Damien, we don't, we don't want to exclude you. So you're right that it's good because it tops it off. If, like it's, I, if, it, if it's introduced into the pond in the right way. Or if the pond's in balance. Right. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we're going to say is because yesterday I saw something. As, not yesterday. Was it? Yeah, yesterday on the way back. No, the day before yesterday on the way back from your job site. What did I see that I, that I made notice of when you were driving me back? Do you remember? There were a lot of things I can't recall. Which okay. Thing. The weather was changing. The weather yeah. was changing. The clouds were dark. Mm -hmm. And there was a flash of lightning. Right. So let's talk about electrically static charged rainfall. What is it? Do you, do you know what that does? Oh, wow. No. Um, I haven't even thought about that. That well, wasn't where I was going. going. You yeah. weren't going with that. No, I wasn't going You're with probably that. going with acid rain or contaminants. No. Um, one of the biggest things that I've, I've seen, especially in, in, in my area, is just non-trained and DIY construction techniques. Um, people not properly edging their ponds because oh, when we so build you have runoff, runoff, exactly. Okay. And cool. not only do you have runoff, but you're washing in all of your dirt, you're washing in mulch, you're washing fertilizer. in fertilizer, all those things. But do you, are you picking up on what, what I'm talking yeah, about? What, I, I do, but I'm not, I'm not. Gonna, uh, do we want to let Jeff field that play or pass? See. No, or I'll, I'll, I'll play, I'll play and do it a little bit. Okay. So okay. when it rains, what happens outside to all the all the plants and the grass and everything else like that. It turned green. It turned yeah. green. Yeah. Why? I know why. Do you want to guess? New guys? New guys? No. New guys? New guys, you want to guess? No. Hold on, wait a minute. We're going to put Steven on the spot. Steven, no. play or pass? Yes. You are sure you don't want to even give it a little bit of a guess? Give it a shot. Come on. Just give it a shot. shot. Just remember, he knows even less than you. Huh? Producing chlorophyll. I like where you're going, producing chlorophyll, because you're talking about photosynthesis, yeah. and we're getting to that. So you're actually right you're on, on the, the right money. Trail. You are No, he's on the money, but, he's, the money. but he did, he's at the end of the process. Oh, gotcha. All right? So that's a great answer. No clue. Come on. No. Okay, just say I like turtles. <laughs> Into the camera. Yeah, right? I like turtles. I like turtles, okay. Do you want to try again? The rainwater wash gets into the soil, which allows the plants to bring up nutrients through the roots, up through, and that ends up with the photosynthesis. Okay, so that that does kind of, oh, but that's so kind of, you're so close. Jeff, you want to, you want to finish the point? Well, it, yeah, it's going to introduce nutrients, but especially the electronic charge, it's... Say it. Come on, say it. I had it and then I lost it. Oh! Nutrients. Oh, nitrates. Because there's what in the atmosphere? Nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So there's nitrogen in the atmosphere. The electrostatic charge binds the nitrogen to the water. And uh, nitrogen comes down as in, in the rainfall. And what is nitrogen as a food source for? Say photosynthesis. photosynthesis. Yes. Yeah, so, so what happens is, is that our plant that's growing inside the pond is a photosynthetic, pl you know, plant. Right. It's just free floating. Right. And it causes the pond to turn what color? Green. Just like the rest of the landscape all around well, us. Well, I think a lot of customers too. They don't realize that green water, if they took it under a mic microscope, like you were saying. It's actually a plant. It's actually it's a plant. It is a plant. It's, it's actually a plant. It's, it's a plant. plant. Yeah. 
So then let's talk about competitive exclusion. And that's where we really need to kind of turn this conversation towards is because we, we're establishing that, that what you feed your fish, you feed your pond. Right. We're talking about the rainfall and the effects of your pond with, uh, with, with the environment around it. And we're building these controlled environments, right? So let's take a look now at competitive exclusion. So if you want to get rid of your, um, your cyanobacteria problem that your customer, or if we want to, or if we want to deal with the, um, the, the, the tannins that John has in his pond in Salt Lake City, right? right then we need to remove its source. Right. So a lot of people, they'll look at it and they'll say, oh, you don't want coffee anymore. Um, well, the coffee's, you know, we'll just take the coffee. We'll, we'll, we'll just put a lid on the coffee. <clears throat> Coffee's still there, but we'll just put a lid on it. Well, the, the food source is still there. Right. Okay. We didn't really remove it. Right. What we did is, is we said, you just can't get to it. Yep. Well, nature's going to find a way. Because it always does. Because it always does. It always will. And cheers, right? And water is the most relentless force on the planet. It's going to find its way. Yep. Right? So what we want to do is we want to say, your algae, okay? Algae, would you like a donut? I would love a donut. How bad would you like a donut? Would you like this donut? donut. This is a beautiful powder <laughs> donut. <laughs> a beautiful donut. A little tiny guy. I really it's want easy. it. All right. I really want it. Now, algae, I know how bad you want this I donut. I want it so okay. bad. Um, but unfortunately, unfortunately, um, you don't get this food. How does that make you feel? I'm going to die. Are you hungry? I'm gonna die. You're hungry. I'm gonna die. You will die without this donut. I'm gonna die without that donut. I'm so, I, I feel so bad for you because you're my friend. We've been friends for a long time. Look, dude, I'm gonna sneak this donut into the table. But the idea behind competitive exclusion is, is that you remove the food source to kill what you don't want to live anymore. Right. I love you, Chris. I want you to live. I gave you the donut and now you're, now you're like, thriving. Hey, Chris. <laughs> you had to do it, Did you do it? <laughs> right? Yeah, so, sure. so, 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 what I'm doing right now is right. I'm feeding you, uh -huh. and you have a desire to eat more and more and more and more and more. And more. And more. Now, imagine, um, sadly, if Chris could reproduce. I'm just teasing <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> with himself, because if if, if Chris is an algae, uh, if he's an algae cell. Right. Chris, do you know what you can? Do you know what your reproduction uh, rate is? I don't know what the reproduction rate is. Do you know what his reproduction rate is? No clue. Do you? No. Five to seven asexually. You do not need your wife to do this, buddy. Per day? Huh? Per day? Per hour? Per I don't know how often. I mean, that's one thing I don't know the answer to. <laughs> my, yeah, ask guess Ed. Is, my, my guess is going to be per day. So as we'll fast as possible. Yeah. It's really not a per day. It's as fast as possible. And if you possible. could answer that for us, that would how be fast great. Is, you know, just Google how fast does algae reproduce. Right. You know, but its life cycle is very fast. So back in my day, we had these things called nuclear fallout shelters. And we did these we do duck and cover maneuvers when we were in elementary school and all this. And the reason why is because we were afraid of this nuclear bomb, right? We were afraid that Russia was, you know, we were still in the height of the Cold War. We were afraid that Russia was going to nuke us, right? Well, in a pond, you still have that kind of an explosion taking place because algae feeds against itself and it's right. reproducing at an exponential rate of five to seven. So one cell becomes five, then those five become another five, and those five now become another five individually, and they're reproducing and at a multiplication, an exponential of five to seven. Right. So that's why when you have new pond syndrome, your pond looks like it's just pea soup. Yeah. Because you have a nuclear explosion that's not contained. It's not, and so the only way that you can stop it is you gotta take away its what? You gotta take away its food source. source. It's food source, right. And so, and so if you want to be successful in pond keeping, <laughs> so if you want to be successful at Chris keeping, um, maybe what we can do is we can limit his food source. Right. And so by limiting his food source, we can keep that algae in the pond because is algae beneficial to your pond? That's a really great question. It is because okay. it does, it does produce oxygen. That's right. When does it produce oxygen? In its growing form. Hold on a second. You know the answer to this because you said chlorophyll. <clears throat> when do plants produce oxygen? During the photosynthesis. You're yes. Gonna, you have to lean forward. Yeah, yeah. it's all right. You, they can still see it. <laughs> they can, plants produce oxygen during the photosynthesis. And what is required for photosynthesis? Energy. 
Okay, where does that energy come from? I'm gonna, I, food. Um, from the sun. Yes, the sun. <laughs> <laughs> so when, so when do oxygen, when do oxygenators produce oxygen? What time of day? During, during the middle of the day. When the during the day, sun. when there's sun, yeah. right? And so, um, and so, if, if, if algae is algae a good source, is is, is algae a good thing for your pond during the day? Yes. Now, what happens if you have too much algae in your pond at night? It uses oxygen. It uses oxygen. That's right. So during during the nighttime, photosynthesis flips, and it's now consuming oxygen within <clears throat> your pond. And that and, and those low oxygen levels, do you know do you know what that produces? It doesn't produce anaerobic. How about you? Do you want to feel that? Mm -hmm. Do you want to, do you want to feel that if it's pull if it's pulling oxygen isn't it producing carbon dioxide though? yes yeah yeah what's the exact opposite yeah because plants need carbon dioxide in order to produce oxygen if they're pulling in oxygen then they're producing carbon dioxide correct so basically what it's doing is, is it's it's pluming oxygen during the day and then it's pulling it back during the night for pluming so when is the best time of day to run your aerator at night. At night. And it's also the, sorry, the number that we were talking before about the public group, the regular groups on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things. The, anybody out there that's shutting your waterfalls off at night to save money on your electricity, stop. Yeah. I was stop. just going to bring that up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, stop. Yeah. Sorry. No, um, no, 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 but you brought it up. So yeah. 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 Right, yeah. Let, let's have you two have that conversation right now. You brought it up. You've, you know, the number of times where I see somebody saying, oh, I just got a new pond or my pump died and I'm worried about, and I bought a new one and I'm worried about electrical costs. So I'm going to put it on a timer and shut it off at night. Is that okay? And it's like, that is anything but okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because like we were just talking, it re reduces the oxygen levels in the pond. Yep. And during the night with that water breaking, yep. it helps oxygen. Right. So, but most people want to do it, but let's, let's go ahead and, and say what people don't want to say. It's not, it's, they don't want to do it from a beneficial standpoint. They want to do it from an aesthetic standpoint. Mm -hmm. During the day is when they want to see right. it. Right, well, not only shutting your filters off, because what does, I mean, you're, when we're talking biological filters too, I mean, what do we need for that biological system Oxygen. to stay, al stay alive? Oxygen, right? yeah, correct. Yeah, flow. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we were talking about this yesterday when we were talking about, or the, no, at midnight, we had a midnight conversation and, and we were talking about the midnight conversation about our wetland filters. I just came from New Mexico working on uh, one of three major wetlands at Harley Calpe of uh, uh, Calpe Custom Landscaping out of Farmington, New Mexico. He has a massive project. You guys have seen a lot of my pictures of it up on my social media. Um, I'm very hurt that I wasn't invited to that, by the way. Because he didn't know about you. Um, <laughs> no, 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 Harley and I talked about that project. Well, you can go back down. He needs help. I will. He Harley, needs help. Harley, hit me up. I'll just give you his phone number. I, think I, I actually think I have it. it just, you know, it's really close to Flagstaff. <laughs> and you know what's right next to Flagstaff is? is <laughs> make it public. Oh, Kurt from Aqua's Kids. I'll call you back, Kurt. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Kurt. We're Sorry, in the middle Kurt, of we're discussion. In the middle of if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, then you wouldn't be calling me. Right, exactly. <laughs> Thank you for your subscription. <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, we were talking about aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. And do you guys remember what we were talking about, the benefits of anaerobic bacteria within a wetland filter or within your biofalls or, you know? It was midnight, right? So... What's what, the difference it, was, between, it was midnight. What's the difference between aerobic and anaerobic bacteria? Aerobic is with oxygen, anaerobic is without. Perfect. So you remember the conversation. Okay. Well, I just, I know what the <laughs> difference is. So, so, so aerobic bacteria completes the what cycle? The nitrogen cycle, yes. right? Yeah. So it goes, it, it, it goes um, ammonia to nitrite to nitrate, nitrate and plants eat the nitrate yep. and, it, and it starts and back it over starts again, over. right? But what does anaerobic bacteria eat? You guys remember? It eats nitrate. Nitrate, uh, yes. That, nitrate. Uh, sorry, no. So anaerobic bacteria eats 50, nitrate. 50 choice here, I knew, yeah. it was, I knew it was one of them. So anaerobic bacteria breeds nitrate and, um, and, and in check, in, in low levels, anaerobic bacteria is actually beneficial for your pond, but it's, it has to be in check in the right levels because right. if it goes out of control anaerobic bacteria exhales um sulfur dioxide 
Yep. Sulfur dioxide. And sulfur dioxide is a neurotoxin. It, he didn't know that. But again, I'm like a walking encyclopedia. I just like geek out on this. You should see me articulate the gospel. Um, but we were talking about, uh, we were talking about um, putting lava rock inside the wetland filter. And if we were to put lava rock inside the wetland filter, um, what would, what the benefits would be? Let's not talk about where we would put it. Um, let's talk about why we would put it. <laughs> the theoretical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because here's where the conversation started. I was out with Harley Calpy and we're in downtown Aztec, New Mexico. And he's showing me, um, this pond that he had installed for this guy in the, in the downtown area. I walk into the guy's backyard and he's like, Oh my God. I subscribe to you on YouTube. I've seen your video on new pond syndrome and you're in my yard. Can you tell me how I can clear up the tannins of my water? So I walk, and it, it, was, it was just like all of that. Beautiful project, really gorgeous, well built. And the visibility is dead on to the bottom of the pond and it's a nice deep project, right? Mm -hmm. Very well done, okay? But it has a little tint to the water. Just needs to be polished just that little bit more. So I start doing what I would, what any one of us would do. We start walking around the pond. Oh yeah. What do we do? We see what we can observe. Mm -hmm. And I go into the biofalls. It's got a really nice Aquascape Biofall 6000 in a pond that probably is a lot less than this. So the, the filtration is right. It's got a nice intake bay. The filtration is right. And it's a really beautiful intake bay. But I look inside, I look inside the biofalls and I, I saw bio balls. Now I know, I know that you guys, I, I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm not pro bio ball. I'm not pro bio ball. You're anti balls. I'm anti balls. Anti balls. I'm pro rock. Okay. I'm okay. I'm, I'm pro rock. Right. And the convert, yeah, and I'm on the record for that. Um, and I think that, I think bio balls have their purpose, you know, but I, but I think that, I, you know, I, and I think that they provide a tremendous amount of surface area for the colonization of beneficial bacteria, but the, colon, the, the beneficial bacteria colony is growing throughout the pond anyways. Right. And I just have really fantastic results with the old school method of using lava rock. And the reason why is because lava rock is, it has a, a, a tremendous amount of surface area for the colonization of beneficial bacteria on the outside of the rock, but on the inside of the rock, because the rock is porous, it allows anaerobic bacteria in very low quantities and very safe quantities to form. So then we were talking about that at uh, at this at Harley's customer's house over over there, and we get back to his job in um, in Bloomfield that he's working on, and I'm like, um, I've never put this in a wetland. And then we start talking, and we start we start talking, and I'm like. Holy crap. I think that'll work, you know? And so what we did is, is we made the decision <clears throat> to introduce a very thin, very thin, not thick, but a thin layer of, um, of, of one to two inch um, lava rock and introduce that into the wetland as a means for an anaerobic colony to, to, uh, to form. So we didn't put in this big thick bed we just right. put it it's it's maybe an inch to two inches max um so that as the water is flowing through it it's still colonizing on the outside and it's now colonizing on the inside and so that anaerobic bacteria is now completing the nitrogen cycle before it even has a plant the chance to get to the plants right and so um by the time we get done getting to the plants and the plants are pulling the rest of the nitrogen out of the water then the pond just has nothing left to survive. So by, by means of competitive exclusion, we've eliminated the food source, the primary food source that plants want to eat. The nitrogen is now removed, you know, and your pond is crystal clear. So, um, how do you guys feel about that? Is that just like over geeking or is that, I mean, is this stuff that people should know? Um, or is this just like too much information? At what point as a professional pond builder is this like necessary to know? I would know? definitely say we are down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yes. Okay, so we're down the rabbit hole, right? Are you down the rabbit hole? Yeah, I'm intrigued. Are you? Well, yes. Well, because sometimes we're taught one way. Right. 
you know, but there's always one way to skin a cat. More than one. There's, there's yeah, always more, more than one way to skin a cat. But, but we're really not violating the gospel of, of, of no. ecosystem management. <laughs> no, but you're just introducing something else. Right. What, to add better. another beneficial layer. Well, yeah. well, it's, but here's we didn't thing. introduce anything. All we're doing is we're explaining how it works. <clears throat> but here's also the other thing about it is, is how long has ecosystem ponds. We're talking about ecosystem ponds here. We're not talking about, we're not talking about outdoor aquariums. Exactly. We're talking about ecosystem ponds. How long have ecosystem ponds and, and the techniques that we use been around? 27 years? 20, yeah, 30 mm -hmm. years, give or take. That's a short amount of time. That's a very short amount of time for something that is actually scientific like limonology. Right. And for the most part, oh, everything that we're yeah. taught Limonology is the study of freshwater systems. Okay. That's, that's what Ed specializes in. That's why Ed is so good at this. But for the most I part... I thought he was just knowledgeable about the benthic layers. Oh, no, he's, 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 yeah. he's just good. He's just good. He's just good. But for the most part... Is that where lemonade comes from? <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, the information that we take and that we that we are introducing into our businesses and our, and our, and our, uh, and our techniques and our methods are developed by... By by almost one, one by the person. study exactly by the, by the study yeah by the study yeah. Well, by doing these things and having these discussions and 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 opening your mind to different ways of doing this it then leads to experiments within right. our within our builds <clears throat> and then leads to further discovery which then leads to furthering techniques yeah. which then leads to you know well not only that but these types of discussions right, this, right. these these collaborations like for example. Um, when I first became a certified aquascape contractor, the quality of the work was not as abundant as it is today. Right. It's not. It, so there were there were a lot of guys that were putting in um, ecosystem ponds that were functional, but they weren't as beautiful as they are. Right. And we've all grown. We we're probably at that stage right now where we where we are remodeling our own work. Right. You know, and coming back in and doing remodels, their expansion projects, and then changing things up and all that. But I think that our exposure to each other through collaboration